Excellent, excellent, excellent. Taking another deep breath in as we start the sermon. <clears throat> so we just finished our full month, our first full month here in beautiful Bayfield, Colorado at the Zen Cowboy. We started with the three aspects of ego, and then we moved on to mastery of thought and the final exchange practice. Talk within living peace, essential teachings for enlightenment in the 21st century. Plug, 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 it's an amazing book. <laughs> but that's what these videos are for. That's what these sermons are for. We're going to be just every, every two weeks, we're going through a different teaching, and then we just split it up. So today we're going to be talking about mastery of impulse and everything that that entails, and I'll read some excerpts from that. But first, who remembers, we'll do a quick recap, who remembers the three aspects of ego? Yes. Push, pull, and hold tight. <laughs> push, pull, and hold tight. I love it. Do you remember any specifics about what push is, what pull is, or what hold tight is? And that's okay. <laughs> that's what these recaps are for. <laughs> and so as we talked about, it's the push, pull, hold tight complex. Pushing is anything that we don't like. And so we develop this resistance uh, throughout our lives to where the, immediately we have that discriminating mind of we see something we don't like, we don't prefer, we start pushing against it, and then that creates negative emotions within, within ourselves and creates that whole egoic experience of conflict. And then the pulling, aka grasping for, that is the things that we do like. That is when we're chasing after things, chasing after love, chasing after success, chasing after dot, 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 dot. We have these goals. And then we think once we have that goal, then we'll be happy. Then we'll be at peace. Then we won't have to worry about money ever again. But guess what? Once you achieve that, there's another goal. And then another thing. And this is going to go a little bit into what we talk about today. Is it's also chasing pleasure, chasing excitement. We want that next thrill. And in spiritual communities, you may even find this as uh, chasing, chasing those spiritual highs rather than really developing your own deep sense of inner peace. You just want to go to that next event, read that next book, and you just like go through spiritual content, but you're never actually fully applying it because you get addicted to that high. And then finally, we have hold tight. Hold tight. And that's when you have something you don't want to let go. <laughs> you have some sense of security you have some sense of love you have some sense of peace you have any anything and it may even be kind of shitty actually it may be subpar but something is better than nothing and you find yourself holding on to abusive relationships you find yourself holding on to damaging addictions a work environment you can't stand but you're getting paid so you might as well stay there for another 15 years and suffer <laughs> we do that and then when we lose it, we get pissed off until eventually we accept it. And then we say, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I let that go sooner? <laughs> it's funny how the ego pushes, pulls, or grasps, grasps for, and then it holds on to things tight. And so if you read Living Peace, that is one of the first chapters in the book you're going to find, the three aspects of ego. And it's delicious because if you're aware if you're able to be aware that you're doing these tendencies, you can then call your ego back into focus. You can then bring yourself back into the present moment and say, okay, rather than reacting to the situation, I want to learn to respond to the situation. And then the past two weeks, we talked about mastery of thought. So we went into the ideas of how a lot of times we're living in the past or we're living in the future, so we're never fully alive in the moment. And our favorite analogy that we use is by Thich Nhat Hanh, who said, one of the best practices you can do is to just wash dishes and only wash dishes. If you can be fully present in that moment, then you're actually alive. But when you're not, and you're thinking about the past, thinking about the future, or some other situation in the present time frame that's not actually in front of you, you're not even fully alive in that moment, because your mind and body are not one. And so we talked about the file exchange practice, and I won't go into that right now, but just different exercises that we can do to bring our awareness back to point, bring our awareness back to presence so that we can be the master of our mind rather than the example I used earlier today, having the egoic mind like a dog on a leash that's constantly pulling you from stimulus to stimulus to stimulus to stimulus, and rather training the mind to be that dog that's on a leash that, can, that waits for your command 
that walks peacefully alongside you. So no matter what's going on in your world, you're able to be present with it. You know, I've noticed one thing I've been doing a lot of is driving. Where do you go when you're driving? You're always going here, you're going yeah. there. You never really, in the moment, and I've really caught myself. More so with that than washing dishes. Washing dishes. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Taking off and thinking of these things that I don't, I need to be right here. You need to be in the moment, Pam. Let it go. Let it go. You can't do nothing about it. Stay in the moment. Thank you for that. And that is so That's powerful. It was really huge for me to get that. Yeah. Because I do it a lot. But it's getting mm-hmm. better where I can just say, get stay in the moment, Pam. You can't do nothing. I'm right here. Because what is the moment? It's the beautiful scenery around you. Exactly. It's whatever your eyes are falling upon. Right. And so right here, I think we're blessed being in Colorado. You know, there's always something beautiful to see in yeah. nature. But even in cities, you can find beauty. I once had like a 45-hour um, <clears throat> commute to where when I was part of the line dancing team, I'd have to drive into Phoenix from the outskirts. And even in the rush hour, I would constantly train my mind to be, come back to point, come back to point, come back to point, being stuck in all these cars, you know, going through rough parts of neighborhood. And rather than being triggered by it, or feeling depressed by it, I would just come back to point, send love and light, drop it. Come back to point, send love and light, and drop it. You know, because a lot of times the things, especially if you're in a city, you might see things that actually make you feel unwell, especially if you're an empath. But again, we here's a hot damn nugget moment. Hashtag hot damn nugget moment. This is something delicious to write down. Stop being threatened by life. <laughs> Stop. Yeah, you want to grab a couple of things? Yes. Stop being threatened by life. And if that sounds too much like a command, we can say it is beneficial to not be threatened by life. Because again, semantics matter, words matter. To not be threatened by life. Because how often do you feel threatened? Your ego gets triggered, and there's, if, nothing's going to happen to you but you're feeling the energy from an external source and then you react you might get anxiety you may feel stress you might feel anger and then one of my favorite things we talked about last week was our subconscious beliefs alter our behavior our the thoughts we think and the beliefs we hold alter our behavior so it is paramount that we learn to change those suckers we learn to shift them the file exchange a bit of what we talked about last week we have we have remember we have the we have the library and then we have all these files of our years and years and years and then we have the the conscious mind which are the library doors so all thoughts that are coming in are then being filed away we have to become that librarian (laughs) and then any thoughts that we're thinking either old thoughts or new thoughts we must shift them to what we now want them to be and then after about ten thousand times of thinking that new thought you now have a new library (laughs) <laughs> or rather you have one bookshelf you have one filing cabinet of new files one bookshelf of new books and now you have to do it like 10,000 more times and I know that sounds overwhelming but I we've all heard many of us have heard of like positive affirmations even the secret talks about that but then we do it like 10 times a day and then we're like I'm waiting for the transformation to happen no this is a lifestyle we're talking about this is a living breathing lifestyle that the living peace code teaches us and it's something we must learn to do every single day. And I cured my depression. I cured six years of depression I was going through as a teenager by using this exercise. And it works, but we have to be consistent. We have to be consistent. Because if you do it for two days and then you skip two days, guess what? Those probably those two days you skipped, you're now back to thinking the old thoughts and then they just replace the positive thoughts that you just put in there. Woo! And that's why these communities that we're building here are so important because when you have brothers and sisters practicing alongside you it's so much easier than when you're just trying to practice by yourself and you're isolated a lot of people especially spiritual folks it's just like well i don't do groups well better get on that bandwagon because groups are what are a group of people is what's going to help support you even more it may take a while to find the perfect group for you and for some people this may not be their perfect group and that's okay but it's important to come together rather than trying to always do it by ourselves. Because when we're doing it by ourselves, we have a tendency to self-reinforce our own ego. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> and so it becomes very easy to not have an out external checks and balance system. So having a community that practices helps check and then also have like a spiritual teacher helps check. Like I love working one-on-one -on -one with people. I just, I butcher you. <laughs> in a positive way <laughs> because it's like if 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 there's anything that you're doing i'm able to pinpoint it in your vocabulary and then say hey are you aware that you're saying things this way hey are were you aware that we've talked about this 10 times over <laughs> and there really hasn't been much growth here <laughs> so let's look at your practice let's revisit this and so it's cool because this next Wednesday, we're starting our student training, Dunisha student training program, healing with the chakras, plug, plug, plug. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be doing that in a group setting, a small group setting. And then as most people know, I do life coaching as well, one-on-one. -on -one. Groovy, deep breath. Woo. So mastery of impulse. I actually... I actually want to start by reading a segment from Master of Impulse because it talks a little bit about my journey into it. It's just a couple paragraphs. La la la, Master of Impulse, flashback. So if you have a book, you're welcome to read along. And by the way, if you do have a book, you're always welcome to bring it because sometimes we'll read certain segments, not always, but it's always nifty to have on hand. And then you can also follow along when you're recycling piece good. So flashback. The angst of my adolescent years of depression was exasperate, exasperated greatly by my obsessive compulsive disorder. I had OCD hard. The worst symptom was excessive hand washing. I washed them so often my hands would begin to crack and bleed and still they didn't feel clean. I also had multiple impulsive tics, often had to complete and often had to complete them in sets of three with a final big one to top off the previous set of three. If I didn't feel satisfied with how they came off, I would repeat them again and again and again until I felt that they were complete. An example of this was the popping sound I would make with my mouth or the twitching of my eyebrow. If I was unable to finish the set of ticks, or worse yet, if I couldn't wash my hands when I felt the urge, my body would tense up in extreme stress that sometimes morphed into panic attacks. I can only liken the power of these feelings to wanting to pull my hair out and tear my flesh off. It was as though I wanted to destroy my own body in order to escape. As a kid in elementary school, late elementary school after recess, I was that kid that washed my hands at, in, the, in, the, in the classroom sink. All the other kids would just go back with their grimy hands and touch their school supplies. I'm over there like a raccoon. Oh my gosh, and I have to do it like three times. And so it was, it was a very stressful thing and then it would actually lead to further bullying and it was just, it was a fun time. But just a little bit, that's kind of when it really started and then it really started to increase. So much so where I would have to use, even at home, I would take my shirt and then I would shut the handle off of the sink with my shirt. That way I wouldn't retouch what I just touched. So a lot of stress there. <laughs> Most of the time my OCD didn't interfere too much with everyday life. The extreme panic attacks only occurred when I felt overwhelming stress at home and in school. Once I removed myself from all medications, when I was 16, and began to study Eastern methods of mastering impulse through meditation, I realized that the impulsive tics I had weren't real. Even though my body felt as though it would go berserk, I didn't satisfy the urges. Each time a compulsion arose, I pushed the sensation of my body aside and focused on training my mind, repeating mantras such as, I am in control. I do not need this to feel complete. I am complete as I am, this feeling will pass, everything is temporary, including this urge, and I am the master of my mind and body. Then I'd sit on my hands and continue to deep breathe, repeating the mantras in my head until the moment passed. Generally, this took between one to five minutes. The urges grew less frequent as the years went on and the OCD became nearly non-existent in my life. To this day, I still have a couple, a couple cute quirks, <laughs> but they are no longer ticks that cause my me stress if I don't allow them to control me. I took back the power of my life using breathing techniques, meditation, and relevant mantras. This works for addiction too. If any of you struggle with any form of addiction, you can apply this teaching. Because addiction is a form of compulsion. Not exactly, but it is. Because I've used this, I've, always, I've had soft addiction throughout my life, especially with food. And I would use these same teachings. And one of my favorite sentences is, there's no lasting satisfaction. Write that down. That's a hot damn nugget moment. 
there is no lasting satisfaction. So even if I comply with my compulsion or I give in to my addiction, a couple hours will go by, 30 minutes will go by, a day will go by, and I'll need it again. For me, it was like 20 minutes will go by, back to the tick. <laughs> five minutes, let's wash those hands again, Alaric. What is going on? And so it's like, no, I had to reprogram it and rationalize it. I needed to rationalize my compulsion and rationalize my addiction out of existence. Because the truer true, we, we must learn to separate between the ego and the higher self. The truer true is that if there's no lasting satisfaction, that is the ultimate truth, because everything's impermanent. Then if I continue doing this thing, is there really any reward to it? And once I realized there was no reward to it, it was so much easier to kick those addictions, kick those ticks, and kick the obsessive compulsion that I struggled with for a lot of years. But here's the catch. What created those addictions? What created the compulsion? It was stress. I think I, when I, as an adult, I reflected back and one of the first times they really started in my life was when my parents changed me to a different school that was very, very stressful until eventually I was changed back. But I had an abusive teacher at the time. I was in a new environment. And I remember that's when all the compulsion ticks started to occur because I had no control of my external surroundings. So the ticks were a weird sense of control I could do within myself, even though it made me feel powerless. It was weird. <laughs> but that was my way of being in control of my own environment. I could just do things in sets of three, sets of three, sets of three, sets of three. So where does it come from? Where do compulsions come from? And then where do addictions come from? Pain, stress, grief, discomfort. And so we find ways to soften them. My compulsions were a stress release, even though they led to more stress. It's weird how that works. Just as all of our addictions, they take the edge off, but don't they lead to more stress and grief and issues? <laughs> Isn't that ironic? Life is full of paradoxes or paradoxes. Oh. <laughs> Life is full of them. And, but if we really want to heal them, we must go to the root and we must learn new ways on how to approach stress, new ways on how to approach grief. And that's where mastery of thought comes into being. And then now we have mastery of impulse. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to go into mastery of emotion, not even telling, not even mentioning the six more tenets after that. So let's take a deep breath. Let me actually look at this. One of the biggest blocks to mass self mastery is people love feeling free. We like to do what we want, when we want. And so when you have a set meditation practice or you have set commitments, sometimes the ego doesn't always like that. They like, it likes to be free, especially if you grew up in an environment that was very controlling or maybe a religion that was very controlling. It's like this whole like organized church business. That's not for me. <laughs> Showing up every Sunday consistently. Some people may not like that. They want to have the freedom. Or maybe I'm giving you guys practices and then you're like, that's great when I feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we resist these things. Or maybe you might be invited to choose a peaceful night over a fun night. Maybe you're invited for the first time of your life to be alone for a whole week and not indulge in being around other people because that is your addiction, to never be alone with yourself. So you're always addicted to being distracted by other humans. Interesting. And so what you're going to be learning here for those of you who continue to come and join the program or whatnot, what you're going to be learning is there's going to be these self-discipline techniques that are going to suck. <laughs> you're not going to want to do them. The ego is going to be like, that's great, but no, I like my freedom. I like my excitement when I want my excitement. I like my earthly pleasures when I want my earthly pleasures. And then here comes Reverend Lark saying, just try not to do that for a day. Just put that down for a week. And the EO is going to want to say no. I love, I've had so many students and clients where they're just like, in their mind, they're like, fuck you, Alark. <laughs> and they tell me, and I love it. Because it, it's, it's true. That's what the ego, when, it, when, when you finally get pinpointed on that thing that is your karmic loop that you've struggled with your entire life, 50% of the people I've met, if not more, withdraw. 
and then they put down the practices and they don't want to do it because it's too hard. It triggers them too much. But nonetheless, that is what we have to do because self-discipline, there's a hot damn nugget moment. Self-discipline is the gateway to freedom, not the other way around. Self-discipline is the gateway to freedom because say you're a smoker. Guess what? When that urge calls, guess what you're going to do? That's not freedom, is it? I once, I once uh, knew someone who had a wedding that almost the entire reception was outside smoking. And so they weren't able to be even present for the smoking because the addictions were so strong with so many of them there. Interesting, isn't it? And again, I don't view smoking or any addiction as bad or wrong. I just look at it as, is it negatively impacting your life? What are the health risks involved? Among many things. I mean, almost everything has a health risk involved these days. But also, how is it keeping you? Are, are, are you answering that call every time it knocks? Or are you the knocker? And are you the answerer? What are these things in our life that are impulsive that we cave into anytime we want it? And often it stems from things that bring excitement or pleasure or comfort. Pleasure is a big one. Food. <laughs> <laughs> we give in to those temptations. And what happens when you just say no for a whole week? What happens is your box of crazy is going to open up. And you're going to get an intimate look at what's inside. And finally, you can start to heal it because you're now acknowledging it. My favorite example that I'm so waiting for, I want to see what Andrew's like without coffee for two weeks. <laughs> 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 and again it's not this huge negative impact of of our life or your life like it's just you know in the morning but it'll be fun one day to experiment and see how does his behavior change if he doesn't have it maybe it won't but maybe it will and so it's fun to experiment and see when we resist and have self-discipline not to do something that is our usual comfort our usual routine our usual pleasure what then comes out? What comes out when you're squeezed? <laughs> but it's true. So how I healed my compulsions and my addictions is I allowed life to squeeze me. I mean, so it works. <laughs> I allowed life to squeeze me and I stopped resisting the stress. And instead I gave in to the stress and I said, great, show me what you got. And guess what? That's why I became a self-aware 16-year-old. <laughs> and I was able to quit all, all medications after six years when therapy wasn't doing a damn thing except numbing me. So I took control at age 16. And then had two great more years. Then immediately went into college, became a life coach, ordained minister, started Earth Spirit Center for Healing, my first business at age 20, and then at age 22, started my first church, our first church. Granted, none of you were there, so. <laughs> and now, seven years later, we're starting another one. None of that would have existed if I was just a typical teenager that just went where the wind blew. Something happy happened, I was happy. Something sad happened, I was sad. Instead, literally every single day, every single night, I didn't really hang out with people much outside of school. I would do this work and I would get to know my mind on an intimate level. And so I awakened out of ego, if you will, because a lot of individuals spend their entire lives not knowing the difference between their personality, their identity, and their ego. And so they have a thought, they think that's who they are. They have a feeling, they think that's who they, who they are. Instead, when I have a thought or a feeling, I'm just, oh, that's happening. Doesn't mean it's real. I'm just having a feeling or a thought based off an external stimulus that is being filtered through my own bias and perception. If I change my perception, I change my interaction. And so I became, a, what's the word I'm looking for? An active participant in the creation of my reality. Write that hot damn nugget down. Become an active participant in the creation of your reality. A little secret action there for you, Kim. <laughs> Pretty cool. Becoming an active participant in the creation of your reality. Which direction do you want it to go? Or are you recreating the same bullshit day after day after day? 
and then you're just waiting for some landfall. You're just waiting for something to change. Or are you actively participating in that creation, in that change? Fun fact, most people sabotage themselves because they're afraid of change. Even if it's something positive they want, we sabotage ourselves because then our life has to change. For 10 years, I'm just like, I want a relationship. I want a relationship. I want a relationship. But then I don't want to change for a relationship. <laughs> I don't want to be alone. I want intimacy. But then anytime I get it, it's not what I wanted. And then finally, one day, I said, you know what? I'm ready for marriage. I'm ready for that full commitment. I'm ready to share my life with someone. A month later, I met this guy. Then boom, six months later, we were engaged. Then nine months later, got married. Next month, we moved here, and here we are. <laughs> and it happens quickly when you set your mind to stuff. But you have to make sure that your mind and body are in harmony, that they're, you're alive in the present moment. Isn't this juicy? Isn't this delicious? Isn't this the nectar of the gods we're talking about? Oh. So let me see what time do we got, Andrew? Oh my. So we're going to go ahead and just conclude there. I have much more to talk about, um, but we'll cover that next week. But let's go ahead, for those of you who have your little handout, let's read that last quote at the bottom. <clears throat> At this stage of our human evolution, we still tend to run on habits of impulse, habits of desire, and habits of comfort. We react, we crave, and we avoid discomfort at all costs. The cost, however, is our inability to be self-aware and exercise self-control. So please, today, remember that self-discipline is the gateway to freedom. And the reason for that is because when you have self-discipline, you are now in control. You are now in control, and so you're not being swept up by the currents of life. Again, you're not living a circumstantial existence. When something sad happens, you're sad. When something angry happens, when something frustrating happens, you get angry. You're not being swept up in the emotional currents or by addiction. You're in control, and you're able to respond no matter the circumstance. Let's take a deep breath. Excellent. And so this is more, I'm going to now talk to the viewers who are watching this after we film it. And so for those of you who want to support the growth of our church, we're setting up our nonprofit right now in our 501c3. Anyone who wants to donate, I will be putting a link at the bottom. And if anyone ever has questions, feel free to send me a question and I might be able to answer it during a sermon sometime. So thank you for everyone who's tuning in at a future time. Blessed be.